Hi students, I'm going to be covering part of the general census lecture. Um, this material is found in chapter 16 of the Saladin textbook. Uh, so general senses are those that are not restricted just to the head. So they're things like pain, touch, temperature, pressure. Um, and during lecture, I covered the uh, more of the anatomy side of general senses. We looked at different types of um, nerve endings, both encapsulated and unencapsulated. And I talked about some of the general properties of sense receptors. And now I'm gonna move on to projection pathways. And we'll also talk about pain pathways in particular and what's called spinal gating um, of pain. So I'm gonna start out with talking about somatosensory projection pathways. And a projection pathway is simply the path that the neurons take from the receptor to the final destination in the brain. Most of these signals, what are called somesthetic signals, travel by way of three neurons. They're called first, second, and third order neurons. And most of these projection pathways have this common um, three neuron, neuron structure to them. So the first order neuron is going to be um, the neuron that actually either senses the stimulus or is stimulated by the sense receptor, the first order neuron from the body, it's going to enter the posterior horn of the spinal cord via those spinal nerves. Remember that if we were to look at a cross section of the spinal cord, we would see, this is not a very <laughs> good indication here we would see that there are posterior horns and dorsal horns rather posterior and dorsal are the same thing so these are these areas of gray matter and all sensory information is going to enter the spinal cord via these posterior or dorsal horns and then motor output of course is going to exit via those anterior or ventral horns. So from the body, those first order neurons are going to enter that posterior horn via those uh, spinal nerves. Remember that there are 31 pairs of spinal nerves throughout um, the spinal cord. And from the head, if there's signals coming from the head itself, the first order neuron is going to enter the pons or the medulla via cranial nerves. Um, and depending on what, um, what purpose the first order neuron has, you're going to see differences in the size of the fibers and the level of myelination. So for senses like touch, pressure, and proprioception, those fibers are going to be large, fast, and myelinated. Uh, so remember that diameter of the axon and how heavily myelinated that axon is, those two properties are going to determine the speed at which action potentials or nerve impulses are sent. Um, so those senses are going to travel uh, pretty quickly. And then fibers that are specialized to sense temperature, the thermal receptors, those are going to be small and unmyelinated. Then we have our second order neurons. Second order neurons typically cross over to the opposite side in the spinal cord from where they synapsed with the first order neuron, and that's called decussation. So the second order neuron typically decussates to the opposite side within the spinal cord, or in the case of signals coming from the head itself, the medulla or the pons, and that neuron is going to end in the thalamus, um, except for neurons that are involved in proprioception, which are going to end in the cerebellum. And remember that proprioception is just the term used for neurons that sense body position in space. Um, so those tend to be concentrated in uh, tendons and ligaments and uh, connective material surrounding bones. And then the third order neuron is going to travel from the thalamus to the primary somesthetic cortex of the cerebrum. Okay, so here 
is a diagram that shows the spinothalamic tract, which um, is a sensory tract within the spinal cord. A tract is just a grouping of neurons that generally have a common purpose and a common route that they take to the upper levels of the uh, central nervous system. So receptors for pain, heat, and cold are going to be sending this information. The first order neuron is going to be illustrated here, and it is going to synapse within the gray matter of the spinal cord within the posterior or, or dorsal horn with the second order neuron. So the second order neuron, <laughs> sorry, my rabbit is throwing a fit right now because I put her in her cage and she was out and now she's sad that she's back in her cage. Um, so it's kind of a distraction. So the second order neuron is going to decussate. It's going to cross over to the opposite side of the spinal cord and then it's going to ascend um, up the spinal cord where it's going to eventually synapse with the third order neuron within the thalamus. So the thalamus is where you're going to have concentrations of gray matter and you're going to have a lot of routing to various uh, pathways within the higher levels of the brain in the cerebral cortex. So the third order neuron is going to end in this somesthetic cortex. So that's the spinothalamic tract and that general pathway, the fact that it decussates, crosses over to the other side of the spinal cord, is going to be a fairly common pattern that we see in other tracts as well. Let's talk briefly about pain. So pain is a discomfort that's caused by tissue injury or noxious stimulation. Typically leads leads to an evasive action. So obviously sources of pain um, are, are going to be avoided if at all possible. And while pain is uncomfortable and it's um, potentially uh, trying to endure that pain, it's very important because it helps to protect us. It helps to protect us from further injury. And in very rare cases, when people are born without the ability to feel pain, they are very likely to be seriously injured just in everyday activities because they don't have any sense of what pain is. That's a very rare thing that can happen, uh, but um, it can happen. And for those individuals, they have to be highly protected and supervised in order to avoid injuring themselves. So it is really important um, it is lost in diabetes mellitus. That's called diabetic neuropathy. It can be anyway in severe cases. Um, so nociceptors are sensory receptors that specifically respond to pain, just like we have photoreceptors in our eyes that only respond to light, and we have thermoreceptors that only respond to temperature. Nociceptors are specialized uh, nerve endings that just are specialized in responding to pain. So there's two types that provide different pain sensations. There's fast pain that travels in myelinated fibers at 12 to 30 meters per second. That's that sharp localized stabbing pain or also called the first pain that's perceived with an injury. And then there's slow or second pain that travels in unmyelinated fibers at 0.5 to 2 meters per second. Uh, this is the longer lasting dull diffuse feeling like what you would feel with a headache for example. Now pain can be broken down again based on where it's coming from. So a somatic pain is going to be originating in skin muscles and joints whereas a visceral pain is going to be coming from the viscera, the internal organs. Uh, this is most often caused by stretch, chemical irritants, or ischemia of viscera, which is uh, generally poorly localized, so it's very hard to pinpoint the exact location of ischemia. Ischemia is lack of oxygen delivery to uh, the viscera. Um, injured tissues also will release chemicals that stimulate pain fibers. There's uh, natural chemical called bradykinin, which is the most potent pain stimulus known. 
it makes us aware of injury and it activates a cascade of reactions that actually promote healing. Um, and then depending on the receptors that are present, you can have um, nociceptors st stimulated by histamine, prostaglandin, and serotonin. So there's two main pathways for pain to travel to the brain and multiple subroutes within those pathways. Uh, pain signals from the head, the first order neurons are going to travel in cranial nerves 5, 7, 9, and 10, and they're going to end in the medulla. And the second order neurons are going to start in the medulla and they're going to ascend to the thalamus. And then the third order neurons are going to originate within the thalamus and reach the postcentral gyrus of the cerebrum. So for ascending tracks for pain, those that are those that are going to be carrying pain signals from any other part of the body aside from the head itself, uh, those are tracks that carry sensory signals up the spinal cord. And again, typically we see this three neuron pattern from origin to destination. Uh, we're gonna have our first order neurons that detect the stimulus and then transmit the signal to the spinal cord or the brainstem. Uh, the second order neurons, which are going to continue to the thalamus at the upper end of the brainstem. And then the third order neurons are going to carry the signal the rest of the way uh, to the sensory region of the cerebral cortex. So pain signals that originate from the neck down, so anywhere within the lower body all the way up to the neck, there's going to be three main ascending tracts that carry those pain signals to the brain. The spinothalamic tract, the spinoreticular tract, and the gracile fasciculus. The spinothalamic tract is considered the most significant pain pathway, and it's part of what's known as the anterolateral system because the neurons involved in this pathway are concentrated in the anterior and lateral columns of the spinal cord. Uh, so this is made up primarily of white matter um, within the spinal cord in the anterior and lateral columns. So the spinothalamic tract carries signals for pain, pressure, temperature, light touch, tickle, and itch. So it's not just uh, relegated to signals for pain, but it's how pain is perceived. Uh, the tract is made up of axons of second order neurons. So the first order neurons would end within the posterior horn of the spinal cord, and then the second order neurons are going to start in the posterior horn, decussate to the opposite side of the spinal cord, and then form the spinothalamic tract. So the tract itself is just considered the axons of the second order neurons, and then the third order neurons are going to continue from where they synapse with the second order all the way up to the cerebral cortex. Uh, due to the fact that the second order neurons cross over, signals are sent to the cerebral hemisphere that is contralateral to the site of the stimulus. Contralateral basically means opposite side of the body. Um, ipsilateral would mean same side of the body. So this is the spinothalamic tract, which I already covered in that previous diagram. Uh, the spinoreticular tract also travels up the anterolateral system. Um, it activates visceral, emotional, and behavioral reactions to pain, and it carries pain signals resulting from tissue injury. Uh, it's made up of axons of second-order neurons. Again, we would see the first-order neurons entering the posterior horn and immediately synapse with the second-order neurons. Second-order neurons are going to decussate to the opposite anterolateral system, and they're going to ascend the cord and end in the reticular formation. The reticular formation, remember, is just a loosely organized web of gray matter throughout the medulla and the pons. The third order neurons are gonna continue from the pons to the thalamus, and then the fourth order neurons complete the path to the cerebral cortex. So with all of these tracks, we're always at least going to have third order neurons, 
uh, but many of them also are going to have a fourth order neuron. And the spinal reticular tract is one where we see fourth order neurons. And then the third tract that carries pain signals is the gracile fasciculus. It's going to carry signals from the mid thoracic and lower parts of the body up to the thalamus, uh, primarily for visceral pain. So pain that's originating within our organs. Uh, the first order fibers are going to travel up the ipsilateral side of the spinal cord and terminate within the medulla. And it also carries signals for vibration, uh, deep and discriminative touch, and proprioception from the lower limbs and the lower trunk. All right, so this is a schematic that shows both the reticular, uh, the spinal reticular tract and the spinothalamic tract. Uh, so this could, this one pain stimulus that's shown could actually travel up both projection pathways for pain. And I'm going to cover the spinal reticular tract since I've already talked about the spinothalamic tract. So the nociceptor, which would be within the dermis of the skin, this could sense um, pain that's coming from, for example, pricking your finger on a thumbtack. The dendrites of the neuron would be initially responding to that. They are the sensory organ. And that signal, of course, is going to travel to the soma. And then it's going to travel in the first order nerve fiber. So the first order nerve fiber is literally just the axon of that um, neuron. So we're going to have that signal enter the posterior horn of the spinal cord. It is going to synapse there. And then it's going to decussate to the opposite side. And then it's going to travel up the spinothalamic tract, which is again just the second order neuron within uh, the spinal cord. And it's going to synapse with the third order neuron here in the reticular formation. And that signal is going to travel up the brainstem into the primary somesthetic cortex of the brain. Now you also have some subroutes here. So you can have stimulation of the hypothalamus and the limbic system as well and feedback from that area. And then this also is going to illustrate the spinothalamic tract. Okay, so let's talk briefly about referred pain. Referred pain is this phenomenon where our body cannot differentiate between pain that's coming from our viscera and pain that's coming from more superficial sites. Um, so more often than not, you're going to have feelings of pain in a superficial location um, from a heart attack, for example. Um, in addition to, or sometimes masking, the actual visceral pain that's coming from the heart tissue itself. And the reason why this is, is because there's significant convergence of neural pathways within our central nervous system. So we have convergence of somatic pathways and visceral pathways, and our brain assumes that visceral pain is actually coming from the skin. So the brain cannot distinguish the exact source. And a hypothesis for why this is, is because skin and more superficial areas of the body are more easily and readily injured. So it's much more common to have a skin injury than it is to have, say, a heart attack. But when a heart attack or more serious visceral injury does occur, our brain just hasn't been able to evolve to the point that it can discriminate between those two sources. So heart pain is often felt within the shoulder or the arm because both neural pathways are going to send input to spinal cord segments T1 to T5. So it's not uh, precisely labeled. You can kind of think of it as not being precisely labeled for the brain to decode. So these areas show, these colored areas on this 
illustration show where um, referred pain might be felt from various visceral pain sites. So for example, liver and gallbladder pain like ischemia or injury to those organs can actually be felt uh, within the right uh, upper chest and neck region. And of course, heart attack, one of the typical signs is pain within the chest area and along the left arm. And again, that's just because we have significant neural convergence here. So the receptors that are sending this signal from the heart are going to synapse very closely with the neurons that are coming from uh, more superficial sites. And when that signal is ultimately sent to the brain, because there is this convergence, it's not able to pinpoint the exact location and it feels as if there's a more superficial injury. So that is the phenomenon of referred pain. And this is really important in a clinical aspect in terms of diagnosing um, problems that might actually be visceral pain rather than more superficial injury. Okay, finally, I'd like to talk briefly about uh, central nervous system modulation of pain. Modulation of pain is basically how we have pain relieving mechanisms of the CNS. And these are called analgesic, uh, meaning pain relieving. They are just really beginning to be understood. The body will produce what are known as endogenous opioids. Endogenous meaning they are produced internally and naturally. Opioids meaning they are opium-like substances. And these were discovered, these substances were initially discovered because of the body's ability to respond to uh, drugs. So if there is a receptor that specifically will bind to opium, for example, why do we have those receptors? There has to be some naturally occurring substance that will bind to those receptors, and indeed there are, and these are the endogenous opioids. Uh, so we have enkephalins, which are two analgesic oligopeptides, so they're uh, proteins that have 200 times the potency of morphine. And then we also have endorphins and dynorphins, which are larger neuropeptides that were discovered after enkephalins were discovered. So these are secreted by the central nervous system, the pituitary gland, the digestive tract, and other organs in response to pain. So they act as neuromodulators that block pain and give pleasure. These are commonly going to be secreted during um, events where injuries occur and also during childbirth. So CNS modulation of pain. This is a this um, schematic is illustrating a normal pathway for perceiving pain in steps one through three, and then in steps four through eight, it's going through the uh, modulation of the pain. Uh, spinal gating is blocking of the pain signal at the posterior horn of the spinal cord. So that's what spinal gating refers to. All right, so let's take take a look at this pathway here. I love these illustrations because it just looks like the person is deliberately injuring themselves. <laughs> it's like a very deliberate co coming into contact with a, with a flame on a candle. Uh, but nevertheless, a nociceptor has been stimulated here. It is going to send its pain signal via the dendrites through that first order neuron here. And the nociceptor is going to release substance P, which is a neurotransmitter. Substance P, think of P for pain. So it's a type of neurotransmitter, and it's going to secrete that onto the spinal interneuron. Interneuron is going to be a processing neuron found in the spinal cord. So that's uh, step one. We're going to have substance P being illustrated right here. And then for step two, we have the second order neuron transmitting the signal up the spinothalamic tract to the thalamus. And then the third order neuron is going to relay the signal to the somesthetic cortex within the cerebral cortex.
So that is the normal way that a signal for pain is going to be sent up to the cerebral cortex. The modulation of pain is going to follow steps four through eight. So step four is we have input from the hypothalamus and the cerebral cortex, which converge on the central gray matter of the midbrain. So this little circle represents the midbrain here. And then the midbrain is going to relay signal to the reticular formation of the medulla. And then some of the descending analgesic fibers from the medulla are going to secrete serotonin onto inhibitory spinal neurons. So this would be representing our serotonin release here within the inter interneurons of the spinal cord. And then those spinal interneurons are going to secrete enkephalins, illustrated here, blocking pain transmission by means of postsynaptic inhibition of second order pain neurons. So it's essentially relying on feedback loop. It's postsynaptic because the pain signal has already been sent, but now there's a feedback system created where that serotonin is helping to block the pain pathway. And then finally, we have um, some other descending analgesic fibers that synapse on the first order pain fiber, blocking pain transmission by means of presynaptic inhibition, presynaptic rather inhibition. So again, presynaptic because the original pain signal hasn't even reached um, the posterior horn of the spinal cord yet. There has not been substance P released, so that's presynaptic inhibition there. So anytime where you have these feedback systems or uh, systems to help reduce pain, that would be spinal gating. Now another pathway of spinal gating occurs when we rub or massage an injury, and this is something that we almost instinctively do. We have pain inhibiting neurons of the posterior horn of the spinal cord that receive input from mechanoreceptors in the skin and deeper tissues. And the rubbing at the site of injury will stimulate those mechanoreceptors, which then stimulate spinal interneurons to secrete enkephalins that inhibit second order pain neurons. So that is two different routes of CNS modulation of pain, and that will conclude the chapter 16 part one. Uh, next topic of lecture is going to be the special senses. Uh, let me know if you have any questions and thank you for listening.